My talk is titled Practical Seed Programmed Autonomous General Cumulative Learning. And um, sorry, I couldn't find a longer title. <clears throat> um, this was as, as far as I could get. Um, I will actually talk about every single one of these uh, concepts mentioned here. We're going to start with cumulative learning uh, and go through to autonomy, generality, and seed programming at the very end, uh, where hopefully things will come together. And if things go according to plan, you should have some time to ask me questions uh, and clarifications, etc. If, uh, if you're so inclined. So uh, here's an overview of what I'll be talking about. So we'll go through these concepts. I need to talk about intelligence because um, the, the particular take on intelligence that we follow, myself and my team and the small group of collaborators, um, really has a, a big influence on, uh, on our methodology. Uh, then I'll talk about cumulative learning, causal relations and reasoning, and lastly, uh, autonomy, generality, and seed programming. So, general machine intelligence, um, well, uh, we assume, let me just clarify, uh, these are basic background things here, but let me clarify those. It's always good to get that out of the way. Uh, we see um, the prototypical setup here as a controller in the body that achieves complex goals in a particular world. So you've got the environment um, and an agent, and the agent is composed of, well, let me first tell you what the world is composed of. So the environment contains variables that can be measured by sensors. Of course, uh, this picture doesn't show sensors and actuators kind of unified, but of course, actuators always have sensors as well. Um, some uh, variables are observable, but not all. And some variables are manipulatable. And we use the term variable fairly loosely here. It can, it's, it's typically actually because the, the physical world is hierarchical, you know, it's, it's a variable that can always be decomposed into more variables. Um, on the agent side, you've got a, an agent being defined as a body with sensors and actuators and a controller. And this controller uh, contains a modeling process and, and we'll go through that a little bit later. Um, we refer to these variables in the world as the task environment, because tasks change, goals and sub-goals change, etc. Uh, it's nice to just unify this as a task plus an environment. Now, notice that we include the body of the controller as the task, as part of the task environment. So normally, um, you would have a controller that already knows how to manipulate a body. And so when we talk about novelty a little bit later, uh, we're, we're typically not including the body, but there, there can be, of course, novelties in how the body is used in a particular world. Now, but the mo ma main source of novelty comes from the observable and manipulatable variables. Um, yeah, so, so that would be the agent's body. Um, it's just very convenient not to have to think about agents that can get drunk because the controller, you know, I just take that as an example, because the controller is part of the body and, the, and because the body is part of the, the world. Of course, this is the case with, with the natural world. But in engineering, we, we get to do a little bit of simplification. This is one of the simplifications we allow ourselves. Okay, so um, intelligence is a controller and a body, or a controller in the body, that uh, is demonstrated to achieve complex tasks. Otherwise, it, it really hardly uh, could uh, reach uh, the, the uh, or, or deserve the label of being intelligent. But there's more. That's not enough. It's not just complexity. It's really about novelty. Uh, and and that's why I uh, want to emphasize that uh, very strongly, as well as th this fact that you have limited processing capacity. The available info vastly outstrips 
the processing capacity of, of this kind of an agent or this kind of controller that we're interested in. So we have, we're interested in worlds that would deserve the term complex, complex environments, complex task environments with a large number of variables, relations and transformation functions. Actually, to strike that giant number of variables, relations and transformation functions. Um, there are complex spatial temporal patterns that emerge out of, of, out of the interaction between these and novelty is common actually no novelty is the rule so this means that our agents uh, do, that the, the kind of agents we want to build are are not really dealing with you know uh business as usual and that brings us to the question what is intelligence and in fact we our working definition and this is based on pei wang's research is is really this it boils down to this figuring out how to get new stuff done if you can't do that you know it, it's i find it very hard to justify the label intelligent so what does that mean um well figuring out new stuff uh, this uh, comes essentially uh, out of the work by pei wang on the assumption of insufficient knowledge and resources and, uh, and, and in fact, this is a, a paraphrasing of his, uh, his AIKR, Assumption of Insufficient Knowledge and Resources. There's always uh, insufficient knowledge and resources. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with something new, that is by definition something you don't know everything about. And getting stuff done. Now, what is that? Well, I have my own assumption here, that uh, my own acronym here, AER assumption of the existence of regularity we assume some regularity because of course if there's just noise uh, intelligence is pointless so we want to get stuff done uh, in in this uh, in a world like that and because we don't know the uh, we don't know the rules of the world uh, if you're if you're building um, an agent that is supposed to operate in physical the physical world in, in what we call reality in the real world then um, it cannot assume that it knows the axioms of its task environment it cannot know for sure whether what it knows is completely and utterly trustworthy so that's um, that's why um, that's what non axiomatic means but let's just start with reasoning why do we need reasoning well, if you have regularity, the most efficient and effective way of handling information about uh, that regularity is through reasoning, the application of logic. And um, what do we count as reasoning? Well, it's processes we typically have uh, stuck these labels on, abduction, deduction, induction, and analogies. Um, there's all sorts of variation on, on, on what these mean and how they're defined. What we mean mostly are kind of the intuitive sense as applied to these, uh, the usage of these uh, processes or, or processes that could be said to belong to these categories when humans do them. So everyday reasoning, really. But non-axiomatic, that, that comes from the fact that you're always dealing with new stuff, as I mentioned before. You cannot possibly you, you actually you, you don't know the axioms of the physical world. We we call it laws of physics uh, because we are hoping that they're laws. We don't really know for sure, but all the evidence so far looks pretty good in in favor of physics that these are laws. Um, however, we're always finding out limitations of these so-called laws. So um, so so that means basically the the reasoning has to be non-axiomatic it cannot be the kind of reasoning that assumes you know all the rules so how does this proceed well um we have a very general way of doing this through hypothesis generation and testing so modeling but it's informed modeling because you don't just model at random um and so learning depends on modeling and modeling depends on reasoning. Now, when you model, you, you, you can't allow yourself to be crazy. You can allow yourself to test 
really wild ideas. And that's essentially some part of science, you know, we, we tend to remember the, the times when someone proposed something ridiculous that then turned out to be really good. Uh, but of course, throughout the ages, people have proposed all sorts of ridiculous ideas that in retrospect actually were ridiculous. Um, that far outnumbers, of course, the ones that turned out to be correct. Um, so now we can talk about cumulative learning. What is cumulative learning? Well, it's learning that happens over time, cumulatively, <laughs> uh, of course, that uh, where, where new information is unified with old prior knowledge. So in a way, in a consistent way, and of course, that's another reason why you need reasoning, you know, um, you need, uh, sometimes you get incorrect information, sometimes you get new information that topples what you thought was true, and you need to reconciliate these conflicts. And also, when you, when you learn something completely new, you need to connect it to, to whatever you know already, otherwise it's meaningless. But we're not going to talk about meaning today. So what kind of information structures are needed for a controller to model complex environments cumulatively? Well, uh, we very quickly are brought to the concept of causation. It's the basis for getting anything done. And remember, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get new stuff done. Okay. Um, you can't really get anything done if you don't know what leads to what. You have to have some idea of what actions will lead to what uh, outcomes. And that's what we call causation. So we need to represent causal relations somehow. Uh, in a world that contains regularity, um, con composed of unknown phenomena, this is what we assume. A small subset of which are manipulatable and a small subset of which are observable and they don't necessarily completely overlap. Um, you need to know how they relate which variables affect which other variables, right? So that's essentially, um, when we have uh, knowledge of that, take any pair of, of variables or sets of variables where, you know, affecting one in some way will lead to an outcome uh, that you can predict um, and that you can use to get stuff done, then we say that they're causally connected. So we don't have to answer any philosophical issues of whether cause and effect is really true or, or if there's any real cause and effect, etc. or if it's all, uh, you know, if we're living in a simulation, <laughs> uh, we don't have to answer that. We, all we have to do is say, well, anything, any practical relations between a set of variables and a set of outcomes is causal knowledge. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, causal relational models, because this is what we call the uh, one of the more fundamental representations that we use uh, in our work. And um, essentially, uh, we, we, we need to remember that these are created, these are intended to be created by, from experience. They're, they're based on observed patterns that the uh, that an agent or a controller essentially can affect through its body so in in the world you know um, if you have a situation or set of variables alpha at time one and uh, whenever those happen you you tend to see at some later time uh, a set of uh, states or situations called beta then you can model that by basically saying, okay, I see alpha leads to beta. It seems pretty simple, right? Well, actually, in, in principle it is. In, in practice, it, it gets a little bit hairy once you start to try to implement systems that, that, you, that use these kinds of representations. Um, the, the process of, of creating these models based on observation essentially involves testing them to evaluate their usefulness for getting stuff done. Okay. Um, and the more accurately and reliably they help the controller to achieve goals, wherever they come from, 
we don't talk we won't talk too much about that but but uh, you know uh, bear with me we could maybe go into that later in the q a session then the more useful they are essentially um so so how how does this evaluation of the model's usefulness proceed well um actually we're we're kind of strapped for time so i will uh, let me see if i can just jump ahead to an example here um if you if you see uh, beta and gamma happen all the time uh, and uh, at the same time as well as alpha you know around the same time um, you can say you know alpha beta and gamma are, are observable variables and uh, let's just say that these are actual phenomena in the physical world I'm not going to take the example of a of a light switch, you know, because the as soon as you press the light bulb, the light comes on at the speed of light almost. So um, it's not a great example. A better example, maybe like uh, lighting a match. For those of you uh, who who know that how to do that, um, it, you know, there's a movement of the match against the the matchbox, and you know, it's, it's it, it may be uh, just under a second or half a second, something like that, maybe 200 milliseconds, whatever it is, but then the match will you know either catch fire or you do it again so you if your goal is to light the match you put it against the matchbox and you move in a certain way and um you could say that there's uh, you could say beta is smoke and, and gamma is is the fire and uh, alpha is essentially the action of, of of moving the match quickly against the matchbox or whatever that is now um if someone watches you do that, they are not essentially uh, doing the movement. They are just watching the movement. So in, from their perspective, this, this is just looking like a bunch of things happening okay, at certain times. And um, for, for this particular uh, situation, when, when you actually, like we are third party observers. We, let's say we know that it's the quick movement of the match against the matchbox that that makes the fire and the light come okay so let's just say that that we know that but uh for someone who who is completely unfamiliar with this and is completely new to the situation this is this is novel so uh, this uh, agent might create a set of models about the relationship between alpha beta and gamma and it could be that that gamma essentially causes beta or that beta causes gamma, you don't know that. Um, the fire and the and the light. Um, it could be that that alpha, the the swipe against the matchbox, actually creates beta and gamma. So that's another way. In fact, you can create a bunch of models here about the causal relationship between these. Now, the the causal relationship is not important if you if you're never intending to light a match. But if you're intending to light a match ever in your future, then it would be kind of uh, bad to think that the fire or the, the, the smoke causes the strike against the matchbox, you know? Um, so, uh, well, that's not the, maybe the, the most perfect example, but you can sort of see it better with the light switch on the wall and the, wall, and the light in the ceiling. Uh, did the light in the ceiling cause the person to press the button on the wall or vice versa? Because they happen pretty much simultaneously. Um, so for anything and everything you observe, you, you can make a lot of models, uh, but only some of them will be useful for, for getting things done. Um, okay, I think I've explained this sufficiently. So interestingly enough, if you create these kinds of models, uh, you know, very simple, uh, sort of binary relationship like that with a direction uh, with a direction in the uh, from left to right here um, what you can do with these is that if you read them forward that is from left to right that they they kind of mean that a may cause B and that's just deduction that's basically saying if I see an a um, I might see a B if you read them backwards then uh, they are abduction. If I want a B, I might try to do an A. So if I want the, the light to be to catch fire, I might want to try to swipe it uh, you know, against the matchbox. 
So that's abduction, in fact. Um, and you might better know these as prediction and planning. So when you, when you tie these together in a, in a unified system that operates uh, on this fairly atomic scale of, of linking uh, models with uh, variables together in, in a certain way, um, what you need is, um, is a unified system with uh, control for focus, we, we call that also attention, the, the learning processes and the planning processes are all kind of unified, then um, they operate on the, these representation. They can uh, make uh, long chains of uh, at various levels of abstraction. And uh, in fact, if we had more time, I could show you some videos of that. But um, let me just uh, jump now to the final uh, phase here and talk about the rest of the things I, I mentioned in the title. So uh, in this view, what is learning? So what is this view? Let me just summarize. We've got the causal relational models that are created like hypotheses and they're, uh, they're, um, they're proposed and tested uh, online and offline, uh, um, uh, on policy and off policy, whatever your, your favorite terminology may be. Uh, um, and because they're tested, in, in fact, and evaluated via reasoning processes, um, there's a whole huge number of potential evaluation uh, methods and, uh, and comparisons that you don't have to do. So you save a lot of time through, through reasoning. And if it's multi-level reasoning, that's even better. Um, so, so what learning then becomes is essentially that whatever you're familiar with, this is the this is uh, models that we that already are good and work that are in here, and uh, you could say that the, this is what you're familiar with, and from that, when you see something novel, you create hypotheses, um, you relate the 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 familiar to the novel, and through hypotheses. You try to grow what is familiar to you. So you keep creating uh, new hypotheses that relate novel stuff to your familiar stuff through your hypotheses generation and testing. And over time, the familiar will solidify and get better and better. And this is, by the way, knowledge about how to get stuff done. So wh why is that important? Well, because essentially everything and anything uh, that animals and, and, and AI systems do is to try to get stuff done, right? If it doesn't get anything done, what good is it for? So, um, so that's basically this kind of learning process that we have created. Now, what is seed programming here? Actually, it's, a, it's quite interesting because what we want is we want to create an autonomous learner. Yes, we also want to make it general. I'll get to that. Well, but we can make it um, autonomous by basically giving it a program at the very beginning. Okay, so that's the seed here. Um, the seed is what bootstraps the initial hypothesis generation. Okay, and that essentially starts to create new from scratch learned models of what becomes then increasingly familiar. So the seed programming is essentially this part here in the beginning. That's essentially what happens when you um, don't know really, when you haven't learned anything. So essentially that's what you're born with. It's a cognitive seed that allows you to bootstrap your hypothesis generation at the very, very beginning of your existence. So that's... Chris, could you it, wrap up in one minute, please? Yes. Thank you. Um, so that's essentially what learning and seed programming. Now, um, and here is where autonomy comes from. Um, we are bootstrapping uh, learning through causal modeling from insufficient knowledge using ampliative reasoning. That's the, all of the reasoning methods that I mentioned and recursively used for subsequent actions also on the knowledge that is new and generated. So it's a meta learning system as well. 
And that's where the generality comes from. Essentially, the ability to learn a domain and learn about how you learned about the domain, because these are recursively um, applicable. And so, in summary, uh, causal knowledge is fundamental for practical intelligence. And I, I ask you, what other kind is there? Um, we use ampliated reasoning, and this leads us to autonomy and generality. So, thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much for, for your excellent talk. Um, there are many questions in chat, and I think I'm going to ask just the first one. This question comes from Pat Langley, and he suggests that, um, that causal reasoning is super important, especially kind of in the real world situations that you're talking about, but that knowledge, um, knowledge chunking and integration with, with past knowledge is especially important and maybe even more important than causal reasoning. Um, and so how do you balance, you know, knowledge reasoning and causal reasoning and learning in the situations that you're dealing with here? Real the, quick, because we only have a minute. Yeah, the, the knowledge is essentially, in, in our approach, the knowledge is captured in, in these rather flexible um, causal models. It's not everything that uh, we use for representing the knowledge. There's also uh, uh, composite states, which are basically decomposable uh, um, steady state descriptions of partial situations. Uh, so these can be combined as like Lego bricks. And what the glue that essentially allows you to, to make use of that uh, are these uh, causal relational. They're not only causal, they also describe relations, other kinds of relations, part of, etc. cetera. So, um, so what, what I've shown, what I've talk, talked here about is, is, some, is a subset of that, but it, it essentially describes very well the whole, the spirit of the whole thing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and if you'd like to go through the questions in the, um, in the chat, we'll have a chance to ask more integrated questions later, but if you wanna address some of those in the chat, that would be wonderful okay. as well. So thank you very much.